Uh, when we got involved, you had the industry that's providing the services to us that's saying there's literally no air concerns. There's no problems at all. And then we had the researchers, the preponderance of researchers, saying there is a problem. There's direct links to many of the problems we have in our daily lives with our bodies. So what I'm speaking about today is, is controversial. Is it a, can it harm, harm you? Uh, are you safe? Is there things you can do to be safe? Or are you not? And I put a little cartoon there, sort of hedging my bet a little bit. Um, that's a lot of money being made. The industry's making a whole bunch of money. So in our environment, we have very powerful points of view that become public. And uh, quite honestly, the researchers don't seem to have the same similar power as some of the influences in the marketplace as the service providers have. Why today? Why is it important to understand it today? Um, when I had a cell phone 25 years ago, I would call my friends. But of course, none of my friends had a cell phone. So when I used it, I didn't use it very much. Most of us didn't have cell phones, so we never really got exposed to much. If you look today, however, over the last 10 years or so, all of us have cell phones. Even our kids have cell phones. We have laptops, we have tablets, we have so many things that are in our environment that is now contributing to the ambient and our, in where we are, the buildings we're in, and that is far substantially greater than the exposures 10 years ago. So why now? It's become a problem that's in our front door, in our room, in our homes. We're gonna talk a little bit about that some more. Um, this is one of these charts I used, and there's a test after this, by the way. Um, electromagnetic, uh, electromagnetic radiation is, is it's a power. It, you can't see it, but there's a powerful image, a signal that's hitting your body, and, um, and it's that constant barrage of that uh, and the many sources of that that are potentially creating the problem we just spoke about. But let me start by saying, um, what's some fundamental definition of it? If you look to the right in the middle, I, I have a wave. That's a hertz. That's one cycle in one second. That's what a hertz is. And everything you hear about today is relative to hertz. What's the speed of the signal that you're being hit with? It's a hertz. It's one, if you go to the beach and you watch a wave, and another one comes in a second later, that's a hertz. So when you think about the spectrum, you begin thinking about from very, very low hertz, which is known as non-ionizing radiation, to ionized radiation, which is really, really, really fast. What do I mean by that? In your house, you have um, either a 100 amp or 200 amp service. It's alternating current at 60 cycles. That's 60 hertz. So when we talk about some potential areas where there's a source of emissions, we talk about the stuff in the wall. When there's any electronics on, your motor in, in your refrigerator, your, your hair dryer that you're drying your hair with, all of those things are generating electromagnetic radiation, but it's at 60 hertz. So that's one form of electronics that we're, we find in our environment today. And then we have the radio frequency stuff. And the radio frequency stuff is the cell phones, the tablets, the microwave ovens, the, the, the um, 5G. It's just a faster uh, transmission. Um, we, we said Hertz. When we talk about cell phones, we talk about one gigahertz. That's one billion cycles per second. 
when we talk about why 5G, we talk about gigahertz, up to 300 billion cycles in one second. So all of a sudden, we, we have this, these emissions that are starting low on our radio signal. They're going faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. That is the issue in 5G that we, you hear in the, in the media today. It's, we're, we're going into realms we haven't been in, and we know very little about as we increase the speeds. So I'm going to reiterate a little bit of what I said. You, you probably heard on the left-hand side of the chart, this was the only radi electromagnetic radiation that existed. And look, it, it's at 5 to 12 hertz, 12 cycles per second. What's also slightly different at, it was DC. It doesn't alternate like EMF does that has an AC driver for it. And so this is the point it never existed in our environment. And all of a sudden, we now have between 0 and 300 hertz a whole bunch of stuff in our house. We have our um, vacuum cleaner, our, our, our stove, our, our refrigerator. Every, everything that's pulling current is emitting emissions on the walls around us, every one. Then we have the radio frequency stuff, as we spoke about in the spectrum, that's between 300 hertz and 300 gigahertz. By the way, the 300 gig is the FCC new defined 5G range, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that. But within that space, look at all the devices we have, our Wi-Fi's, our, our our tablets, our laptops, everything we have around us. And we have refrigerators talking to our tablet app application to see if there's, if there's a milk in, inside the refrigerator. Uh, do I really need to know I have milk in the refrigerator for my a machine talking to another machine and at the same time emitting something in, in my environment that is detrimental and I won't be able to drink it 10 years from now? So, microwave, at the very bottom, I, I really like to talk about this as the prelude for the next set of charts I'm going to talk about. And that is, your, micro, your, um, your router is, works at 2.4 gigahertz, 2.4 billion watt of cycles per second. And your microwave is at 2.3 gigahertz. What happens when you put something in the microwave? The water in between the cells heats up, oscillates the cells. They oscillate so quickly, they cook your meat. That's how it works. So when you put a cell phone to your head, you have the identical frequency hitting your head. What is a microwave? It's known as a thermal emitting signal. Thermal. That means at 2.3 gigahertz, science knows when it hits you, it's going to heat you up. So the question is how much? And what long durations do you have to worry about before that happens? And when you use your cell phone, and maybe you, particularly women, I'll tell you that why in a bit. If she said, my hurt, my, my, I'm, I, it's hot. My, my skin is getting hot. Her meat's cooking. It's literally, you feel the energy being ab absorbed within the body, heating up the water between the cells, and it's oscillating. That's what you're feeling. And that's, we'll, we'll talk about that. Okay, what do I mean by our environment is getting a completely full uh, of, our, of the emissions in our environment. So let's talk about the standards in this space. Um, about 78 or so, um, the FCC said, we have to make sure we're all protected. 
And what they did is they said, we got to figure out what's out there in the marketplace that we have to protect. So what they decided to do is go to the Army. They went to the Army and they said, let's take this large group of adult males, typically six foot, and let's try to figure out how much heat the thermal transmission would occur. Remember the microwave? How much heat should we allow that area of the head to heat up? Then they said, how far should we let that signal go into the head? How much? They said, two inches. Thermal. Only thermal. And at the time, I, as, as I said before, I had a cell phone. I didn't call anybody because no one else had one. Now, all of a sudden, everyone uses it. So the, a casual use of a cell phone in 1987, or 86, was six minutes. I can't get my son off the phone in I, six hours, no less six minutes. All of a sudden, our pattern of use is fundamentally changed. Um, and what's the impact of that? We have a standard that protected a six-foot six foot male. At the end of the day, that's about 3% of the population using cell phones today. Only 6%, uh, 3%. And so when you give a cell phone to a female, when you give a cell phone to a teenager, when you give a cell phone to a child, the penetration is different. And we'll talk a little bit more about it, but moral of the story is a child that goes completely through the head, heating up the head. All research and science today in this space that we're worried about is the biological impact, not the thermal impact. The biological impact. That's where research is finding all the interaction between the, the, the transmissions in our bodies. It's not the thermal, it's the biological. So for that very reason alone, the SAR rate, the specific absorber rate that has become the standard, really only represents 3%, of the population, using it six minutes per day, adult male, six foot. That's what it is. And by the way, if you lived in Europe, you're protected twice. The signals, relatively speaking, are half the, exp uh, the uh, exposure to uh, uh, European than it is us. We have the highest level of transmission uh, that you can have um, for a cell phone. Um, I actually had friends of mine who went to the FCC years and years ago who represented um, the technologies. They were brilliant, brilliant engineers. And I, people that, that I personally believe were brilliant engineers. Not one of them was a biochemist. Not one of them was a medical doctor. Not one of them was a so our standards bodies that created were a bunch of electrical engineers, medical-based experts. So there was never consideration to biological, but it's sort of under I understand it because they were engineers. They weren't worried about the body's impact. Um, another sort of side note about this is current head of the FCC, um, he worked in his previous job as counsel for a fairly large um, service provider. He was an industry expert that went into governance of the industry. His predecessor was the head of a very, very large uh, cellular association, a, a consortium that represented 
uh, the um, interests of the service providers. He actually looked at what the impact was of cell phones way back when with um, a physician, epidemiologist actually, and he, he wanted to see if there was a link between cancer. This epidemiologist found a link. That guy ended up losing his sponsorship, his epidemiologist, and actually his career went, went disappeared actually. And that guy, who was the chairman, went to the FCC and he approved 5G. So this is not unusual. Um, it turns out that if you look at the pharmaceuticals, all the executives that were driving the pharmacy industry became leading the governance of that. It makes some sense because they need to understand what it is they're governing. But on the other hand, they're pretty sided on the views they potentially can represent. And by the way, that's not only in the US. All the governance bodies in Europe that drive the standards have similar kind of incestuous relationship with the market. Goes through the child's head completely. It's thermal and biological. For the first time within the last 10 years, we have children using without any study on the impacts. So I'm an old guy. I can use a cell phone if it went through my head, probably wouldn't hit very much. But kids at the earliest age with biological impacts to the head, it's sort of like potentially a serious problem in time. We don't know yet. Why? Because we haven't used it much. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, science and research and what we know about it. Um, the federal government, six years ago or so, funded the National Toxicology Program. It's a division of the federal government. And they were looking to basically justify the standards. Um, and by the way, the federal government hasn't spent much, if any, money outside of this, in this space. And of course, as you know, we were a leader 30 years ago, but we have no scientific research going on today. So when the NTP study came out, it was an epidemiology study in which it was statistically significant. In other words, after the results were met, I could say confidently, by 95% confidence level, that what we found is real. So they had these large populations, transmitters in these epidemiology studies, and they watched over time what would happen. And what they found was there was frontal lobe cancer. There was heart cancer, statistically significant. I'm, off, I'm often asked why there seems to be such a dynamic in the market and, and such differences of opinion. Well, I'm an engineer, and when I look at something, I look at the statistics. And the only way I could accept the direct link to a human is by taking 10,000 children, lock them in a room, and 10,000 children and radiate those children against these. And what I'm going to do is watch who dies over that 20-year period from exposures to RF signals. And then I can say definitively, statistically speaking, I can say 95% confidence level that frontal lobe cancer they got is consistent to the whole population. So if you wonder why there's this drama in the marketplace, is because there's not statistically significant data, but a heck of a lot of information we learned that 
megadata, the mega study of the studies certainly indicate there's a problem. But here was the first case in a long, long time where we now had statistically significant proof. That was followed up with Ramazani's study. Ramazani's in, in, in Europe, and actually Italy, they have a consortium of researchers. They did almost identical what they did in the US with the NTP. They found the same thing. They found the frontal lobe and the heart cancers. Um, and so that's like pretty interesting. They found the same results from the same exposures and the epidemiologies from the same, having the same effects. Um, and so um, you look at the preponderance of research, the preponderance of research that talks about the linkages between body response to RF signals. And there's without a doubt, no question by most who are aware that they're drink linked. Um, and if you hear um, a, a, um, a microbiologist say, there's no links, what you know is either they're really, really stupid or they haven't looked at the research. Because if you look at the research, there's a clear preponderance of evidence to talk about the linkages. So the debate about up to 4G is not a debate by most of the science and research community. Um, the uh, National Toxicity Program, part of the government, got sort of not what they hoped for. They got a link, which they didn't want. Let's talk a little bit about the World Health Organization. It's a national governance body on all of the world's health. Uh, they, they classify electromagnetic radiation as a... a 2B carcinogenic. It's possible that it's a, it can cause, it's possible it can cause cancer. It's not probable, it's possible. And so, what does that mean? Well, if you go and have a Wi Fi in a classroom, it's possible there may be a linkage between the Wi Fi signal and your kid. It's possible. What are other 2B carcinogenics? Arsenic is a carcinogenic that fits the 2B category. Welding, the smoke from welding is con considered a carcinogenic. Here, a volatile organic compound. The fumes from gas or petroleum are considered carcinogenic, possible carcinogenic. So I like to think of it this way. When we have a class, and we have a bunch of new students, and all the adults are out there, and we, we talk about our classroom, and we're going to put Wi-Fi on, we say to the audience, by the way, it, you know, we have Wi-Fi, and, 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 and it's exactly the same kind of potential carcinogenic as the welding. So it's like welding all day in the classroom, and all the smoke is going to influence our kids. It's like the gas is going to generate a volt organic compound which can potentially bother your kids. And of course, the adults in the room would say, what? You're exposing my children to a carcinogenic of that type all day, seven days a week, or five days a week, seven hours a day? That's sort of like the question you need to ask yourself when you hear about Wi-Fi in a classroom. And by the way, it's only the thermal that was ever considered, not the biological. So we have um, others who begin publishing the plethora of research that we know about. Um, the Bayer Initiative uh, is one group and actually, Dr. Carpenter out of New York, uh, uh, Albany, I think he's out of, um, for 30 years has been writing about the impact of emissions to us. Uh, Blake, Dr. Blake, who was in um, um, Columbia, uh, for years has been uh, 
uh, talking about electromagnetic radiation. He's been publishing in Bioinitiative. Dr. Olli Johansson out of Sweden has been um, writing uh, pretty serious publications through Bioinitiative. So if you want to know more about it in detail, you, you really want to go visit their site, the Bioinitiative site. They, they do a pretty good job and have been for years and years and years. Um, we also have other sources uh, that talk about the plethora of impacts, and that's with uh, uh, Dr. Joel out of uh, Berkeley. He's, he's been an advocate for years, and um, actually he's pretty instrumental in changing some of the legislative uh, impacts in California with his work. But he's a wonderful source. He keeps current with all the research that's coming out throughout the world, does a very great job. And then, of course, um, Environmental Health Trust is Dr. Deborah Davis. I think she may be talking next week. She's been tirelessly working this subject for years and years. And she's actually put together a wonderful group of uh, experts that are producing uh, really solid work and representing us in legislative and, uh, and uh, public information. So you, you really want to go to these other sources if you're looking for more information. In Italy, there was a, they went to court and they said, the use of my cell phone is directly connected to the frontal lobe cancer I got. They won, it went to appeal. Then it went to another appeal. They still won. And the appeals court said, we couldn't rely on what the service provider was saying. It didn't make sense to us. They clearly had a, a position. So we have a lot of Berkeley. When Berkeley uh, went to say, hey, I want to put a, uh, something on the, on the outside of it, warning people, use just like cigarette smoking. Um, C CTIA, which is a consortium for cell phone users, um, that was, um, I'm being, <laughs> being distracted, he's making a lot of noise. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and so um, twice they went to appeals court and they lost every time. So this is very good information to know because in my opinion, when you have a groundswell of court I quit smoking 35 years ago, 40 years ago. I know that cigarette, we know the research knew it was a problem, but we didn't know. We only found out because they lost in court. So I see some of that happening now. And so um, there's more evidence. What can you do? I love this chart because all you gotta remember is bees in the room. One bee won't kill you, a thousand bees will. So when you are in a room, you have a cell phone on, you have um, the, the connection to the cell tower, the Wi-Fi transmission, and the Bluetooth. You have three bill, Bs in that one device. How many of those devices do you have on? All omnidirectionally feeding that room. So you, what you gotta do is methodically go through your house and think about where these transmissions are. If you have a tablet, like for example, I have a tablet. I have an ethernet connection. I don't have it Wi-Fi. I don't need it. I, most of the time I do my work there. So I, I manage my environment by considering where those bees are. I turn them off when I don't need them. So think about that. Where are the bees in the room? Turn them off. When you have you have a logarithmic drop off of power levels when you go directly to your head and literally four feet away. It drops down to 90 to 99% power level drops by four foot. If you take it one to two foot away from your head, 80% of the dangers are gone. So this distance you are from your device is very important. What does that mean? When you take your, laptop, your cell phone home, you put it one place, where you're not sitting. Just put it away from you. The danger of that device goes away simply by moving it. If you are on and you're using it more than six minutes, don't go much more. 
you really want to be careful. When you're using it a short period of time, there is no danger. Don't panic. But if you're going to use it for an hour, use a wire line. Use, use a cable to it. Use it in your hands in the speaker. Um, and, and then, of course, uh, there's shielding. There are ways to prevent the omnidirectional signal going in a specific direction. So you want to look for devices that can be used. But you've heard throughout this time, gut, uh, mineral balance, and cell health. More than ever before, you got to ensure these are in place because you're being exposed more and more to, to environments that are more and more dangerous to you. 5G is, is small cell towers like that. It's millimeter waves in certain parts of the network. It's beam forming in networks and full dual it goes back and forth. You'll be able to send as much out as you get. It's massive MIMO, multiple in, multiple out. So there's technologies behind all of this that is enabling us to have the benefits of 5G. And so you'll be able to walk on the road. That will be able to connect to your refrigerator when you ask, where's the milk? Very important to know about this. And this is where it is sort of you need to pay attention to. Because on the far left side, we have 3G, 4G, roughly 9 meg to six, about 6 gigahertz. All those networks still exist over the foreseeable future, the next 10 years, most likely. Um, then you have low frequency stuff. Basically, they call it uh, six gig sub, uh, sub network and below. Your TV with the antennas were 600 uh, um, uh, megahertz. It always existed. But the FCC now has allocated availability of that. And when you hear about Sprint, it's somewhere between 700 megs and 900. That's how they're giving you the service. It's not the millimeter stuff they're giving you. They're giving you stuff that existed for years and years and years. But it's separate from already a pre-existing network. Then you go, and there are other emissions at different levels that are up into the 10 gigahertz space. When you hear 5G is going to kill me, it's about the far right. It's the millimeter, 26 to 60 gigahertz. We can go up to 300 gigahertz, by the way, based on the FCC standard. But it's the stuff that's at the far right that is where the debates are, for the reasons I said. Okay. MIMO, multiple in, multiple out, and beaming. What this is, is 5G at the MIMO level, at the, uh, the uh, far end of the spectrum, at the small cell, is focused signals. They're omnidirectional, by the way, but there are two signals being sent. See the two red little beeper things? Those are, are uh, um, antenna phase array uh, transmissions. They actually can adjust. And when they adjust, they focus that power. See where they transition? They connect to each other. And they, you see that beam that comes out? That's controlling beam. That's MIMO. Remember the elephant I talked about? With 4G, they used one jackhammer. This is two. They're focusing it in. And I created this image just so you can see that that now focused beam is going to go to your, your head right through others, potentially. So we know that there's a high concentration of power that's never existed at a, at a level of transmission that has never existed. And it's targeted specifically to your head. This is the concerns of 5G, not all that other stuff. So let's talk a little bit about that. Notice on the bottom right, excuse me, left, see those little cell towers? 
That's why, that's because they can't go more than 850 feet. They have to be right in front of your house to be able to serve the back of your house. 850 feet at 23 gigahertz. That's a long way to go. And what's really somewhat interesting that no one realizes is that's at 20 watts. Remember the cell phone is 1.6 watts? This is transmitting at 20 watts. A cell phone far out there, it's 60 watts. So it's a third of a transmission that's serving thousands and thousands of customers right at your front door at 20 watts. So all of a sudden, we're going to have a whole lot of stuff hitting our, our bodies like never before and with beams focused to that. Bees. Those bees, by the way, are bees that were at a 5G site and they died. We know 20 gigahertz through research, 20 gigahertz is absorbed five times more than 4G in a bee. If you went to a trial, uh, if you looked at some study up to 4G and you put a transmitter inside a beehive, they wouldn't come back. Now we're 20 times higher and five times more absorption. Well, will that do? I don't know, because this is not statistical. I can't tell you what's gonna happen, but I can tell you some cases it is. I already told you about the bacteria problem. We know at 20, at 20 gigahertz, we know for sure it accelerates the bacteria, the biome of the, of, the, of the stomach, even more so than up to 4G at two gig. Um, and the FCC has allowed us to go up to 300 gig. 6G is starting at above 300 gig. We know from research, uh, Kylan and I wanted to, we, we, I went to school right here, and they were, they were, they're, they're, the protests are going on. Kylan's a, an expert in what happens to a signal when it hits your head, your body. She knows at 90 gigahertz, the spiral sweat glands of your body absorb as an antenna to your body. That's why these activation denial systems are so effective. They heat your body because it's a receptive, uh, it modulates directly at the levels of a, of a 90 gigahertz signal. So we know from some study work at some of the frequencies using that there is potentially danger to the user. And here's some examples of some of the news reports coming out in the marketplace. That, that some of the stuff we're seeing is, we already know is happening. And, um, and, and so some of the claims being made by one side of the, is, is sort of coming to fruition, um, and you should know. So you need to decide if this is a problem for you. One thing's for sure, I can't control my son. I can't control my wife. I can't control my grandmother. I can't control my kids for sure. And their kids, I don't have any because I invented technology to shield my son. I still don't have grandchildren. But you control your environment. You're the architect of your environment. You really need to think about what you can do to eliminate the bees in the room. Thank you.